wonder if you can guess who this group of people is. Okay, let's see. Let me, let me just think. <laughs> okay, they're, they're living up to billing. Absolutely. I told you. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, yeah, you're just starting. <laughs> I, like that. I like that he has an answer already. I'm shorter because I'm 11. Yeah. Well, you don't need a step. So. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Let me just start off by saying, don't wait for the tall joke just yet. Uh, but let me just say that I am standing in uh, for one of the tallest commissioners, if not the tallest commissioner of New York City, Greg Bishop. Uh, and I've been asked to stand in for him since he's unable to make it here. And so in the tall order that I've been given is to introduce go, the tallest mayor so we can now recognize the tallest politician. And so I want to congratulate our uh, council member. Uh, but also let me just say that once again, Brooklyn gets the bragging rights, right? Yes. Yeah, so go Brooklyn, go Brooklyn. Uh, my name is Dr. Tori Nisterling. I'm the Assistant Commissioner of Health uh, at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Specifically, I lead the Brooklyn Health Office uh, doing the great work, and it is an uh, honor and distinction of being a, uh, in the above average height club. Uh, and so even as a family doc, I am personally and professionally uh, knowledgeable, of, knowledgeable about being in the 75th percentile in height. And so to all my fellow tallies, this is your day, all right? Uh, again, I want to congratulate our, my friend and council member of the 36th District, Councilman Robert Cornegie, on this recognition of being the tallest politician. Uh, you know, but one thing I do want to say is this is not only about setting records. Uh, as Joe has shared with me the context, this is about changing a narrative. Uh, because quite often we hear how frequently young black boys are being told to play basketball and do other things. But uh, obviously, Councilman McCornegy is setting another record. And so here uh, to provide further remarks about Councilman Carnegie, I'm here to introduce our mayor of New York City, uh, who has also been blessed with a tall gene, such as Carnegie and myself. Uh, he is the 109th mayor serving the great city of New York uh, and uh, the tallest person to ever serve as the mayor of New York, New York City, as I've already said, uh, our mayor, Bill de Blasio. You know, on behalf of tall people everywhere, I want to say this is a great moment for our community. Yes, it's true. I'm the tallest person ever to serve as mayor, but today we're going to, we're going to recognize someone even taller. And uh, I want to say, Dr. Easterling, thank you. Thank you very much for your opening comments. And I think this is also going to mark the beginning of a, a new occasion every year, Tallness Awareness Day. Uh, <laughs> you know, have you hugged a tall person today? <laughs> Have you helped them when they bump their head on the subway? You know, we just have to think about all this and be sensitive. So, all right, just like Dr. Easterling, I'm going to ride this wave a little bit here. Today, we're here to bring honor to someone who has brought politics to new heights. <laughs> Even at my size, I look up to Robert Carnegie. And don't take it. They're, these are great. They're, I mean, the writers are amazing. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, seriously, this is, this, is a, this is a matter of fact. And don't take it from me. Take it from the Guinness Book of World Records. This is amazing. You, my friends, are in the presence of the world's tallest elected official. <laughs> now, to be clear. Uh, his parents get responsibility, and, and we thank them for the tallness. But the elected official part was him and his family working so hard in public service. And clearly, and I remember, Robert, when you were coming up, I remember you ran for council in a very crowded field. Uh, and it was not easy, but you had done so much good in the community. People saw your earnestness, your commitment. So. You wouldn't be getting this world record today if you had not done that hard work to become that elected official. So let's honor that hard work, and we appreciate it. Now, tall man needs a tall family, 
and four of his six children are here, so let's hear it for Nicholas and Nia and Nkosi and Noah. And you, sir, remind me your name. Noah. Noah said to me, coming in, he's only 11, so he's immediately claiming the fact that he is going to be much taller before this is over. So. <laughs> now, this great city of ours, there are a lot of skyscrapers in New York City, but Council Member Robert Cornegy is the only one who serves in the City Council. Robert's contributions are as giant as he is. And now this is actual stuff, and I saw it with my own eyes. He fought tirelessly for something that had been wanted for a generation to get a community center for the Marcy Houses. Congratulations for that. He is a family man and a feminist, and so he co-sponsored the bill that ensured New York City would provide lactation rooms to any mother who needs one. That is progress for our city. He has been one of the leaders on fostering and supporting minority and women-owned businesses, and he is the chair of the MWBE Task Force in the City Council. And in the fight for affordable housing, one of the great leaders today is the chair of the Housing and Buildings Committee of the City Council, who is also Robert Cornegy. <laughs> He's achieved a lot. He has a lot to be proud of, but this man's head is never in the clouds. <laughs> Despite the fact that his head is quite literally always in the clouds. Okay. <laughs> I can't wait to see what world record Robert Cornegy breaks next. He has limitless potential. Yeah. And we are very proud of you today. And so, Robert, let's have a moment to celebrate you with the official. Just very, very few, very few words. I, I want to thank uh, the mayor who runs the safest city in the world for taking the time to come and celebrate uh, this small honor with myself and my family. Um, he uh, introduced my family uh, today. Um, I also want to, <laughs> there's someone here, or there's some people here who were actually responsible for this. So you may have read how difficult it was to actually get this honor. It wasn't an easy thing. Guinness Book, around, Guinness Book of World Workers doesn't fool around, and they don't take your word for things. So we had several measurements that had to be taken in several positions over a long period of time. Um, I first did it with my alma mater at St. John's University. I went to see my trainer, who was the trainer eons ago when I played there, uh, Ron Lefonte, who's still there. And for whatever reason, they didn't particularly care for his measurements. So I guess they thought our relationship together meant that he may actually stretch the truth, which he did not. And so I, I was lost uh, for a very long time in, as to what I was going to do. And then I realized we had one of the premier health institutions in my district, which is Interfaith Hospital. And I called Interfaith Hospital and I asked the doctors if they would help me. Because be, prior to calling Interfaith, my next call was going to be literally to the circus. They were like, well, they, got, they have to measure circus animals some kind of way. Maybe they have the equipment there <laughs> to measure you. Thank God I didn't have to, I didn't have to do that. Um, so I'm joined today uh, by two of, the three team of, two of the three out of the team of doctors who are responsible for not only measuring me, but actually putting their credentials on the line and um, submitting them 
to uh, Guinness Book of World Records. So I'm joined by Dr. Khalid and Dr. Mukhtar. who also had to take time out of their busy schedule of saving lives to, <laughs> to actually three times during the course of one day uh, measure me. Um, and I'd like to honor them with the award that Guinness gives to those people who've committed themselves to making a record possible. So they have a miniature version of my award. <laughs> Dr. Mukhtar and Dr. Khalid, can you just join me and accept? On behalf of myself and Guinness. <laughs> These awards, Dr. Khalil here and Dr. Mukhtar. Um, thank you so much thank you uh, for being patient with me because we had to go through several iterations of getting this done. Um, I won't tell you the grueling process that it took over the course of 12 to 18 hours uh, to get the record. Um, they, take, they measure you during the course of the day and then take an average of those measurements. Um, and I started to get worried because this whole process took two years and as a, a man over 50, I thought osteoporosis would set in and I would certainly lose the record <laughs> if I waited another two years. So thank you guys for making it happen. Um, but today, uh, it's, it's, yes, it's about um, height, but I wanna say to all of those uh, young people out there who may be faced with the idea that because of their physical attributes or because of how they were born, they are re relegated to doing a particular thing. And I talk to my children about it all the time. Now, now yes, they are, they are athletes and participate. Oh, special shout out to the two that aren't here. Nyla Cornegie, who is a 4.0 student at Rectory School Boarding School in Connecticut and a star athlete. And my oldest son, Rob the Third, who is starting a new job and was unable to, even though his father's a council member, get the day off. Yes. Um, but we talk in the house about uh, not only athletics, but we talk about being student athletes and mean that in every sense of the word. And when we talk about the fact that you can lead no matter how you look and no matter what shape you're in or no matter what size you come in, um, we, we mean that. And today I get a chance to send a resounding message to all the young people in the world who may have uh, uh, come in different packages. So they may not have the uh, normal physical uh, stature uh, and would like to still make a difference that you can absolutely do that and you don't have to be relegated to a particular segment of society based on how you look. And that was important to me and I fought so hard so that I could use that platform uh, to be able to do that. But let's be clear, my competitive nature said, when I found out that there was a possibility to do that, I wanted to bring that record back to New York and in particular back to Brooklyn. So. <laughs> So now, as this goes out, Mr. Mayor, I got to tell you, uh, they're promoting some guy in Croatia right now who they think is a, is a, is a third-level legislator somewhere who's really tall. But we were the first yes. to do this, and New York leads as it always does um, in, 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 in the world, literally. So this is an exciting day. Um, I wish that I could spend it enjoying it, but I literally have to get back to work serving the city just like you do. So I want to thank everybody for, for being here. I want to thank you for the opportunity to use my physical attributes or what God gave me in this package in order to lead and be, make a difference in the city. Thank you. I just want to conclude. I just want to summarize what Robert said. <laughs> <laughs> That, oh. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> I want to announce that I have won the Guinness <laughs> World Records. Upon further reflection, the Guinness people decide. Uh, I just want to say I want to summarize a very heartfelt, inspirational message that Robert just gave us in these simple words. Aim high. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Well Thank you oh, yes. So it's funny that you asked that. I have a constituent that probably everybody that's an elected official in the city of New York is aware of, Joe Gonzalez, who is here. <laughs> This was all Joe Gonzalez's idea. I'm not exaggerating. He came to a meeting one time and he was like, in the middle of berating me for some legislation I hadn't passed, 
he reflected on the fact that you have got to be the tallest elected official in the world. And I said, come on, Joe. I was already angry because he was doing the Joe Gonzalez thing and he can get at you. And he just kept calling. He said, Rob, we really have to. This is Brooklyn. This is we have to represent Brooklyn. And it's because of Joe that I was resilient enough to get it done. So I actually want to thank you, Joe Gonzalez. Uh, thank you for that. But really, really, in all seriousness, thank you for your advocacy uh, around all things bed -Stuy, for sure. Thanks, Joe. Tell us some of the good things and some of the drawbacks with being so tall. Sure. So, so obviously, uh, because of my height, I had a very short-lived life of crime. Uh, <laughs> right. So, I, really, my choices were limited as to what I wanted to do. But no, seriously, I come from a family of public servants. Uh, my dad was a, a pastor, which uh, probably most people know, and um, uh, we were raised with the mantra of servant leadership. Um, so one of the good things is being, you know, uh, you can either uh, be someplace or be present. Uh, because of my height, I don't have the luxury of making a choice. They're not mutually exclusive. So anytime I am somewhere, I am present. Some of the bad things are, you know, there aren't special accommodations made for people almost seven feet tall. So a ride on the subway, which probably most of you uh, enjoy. In the city of New York, I don't so much. I sit anticipating whether or not when that train pulls in, I can dart for a seat because I can't stand up on most train cars. So I have to, there's a, there's a moment of anxiety as I hear the train coming as to whether or not uh, some senior will beat me to a seat <laughs> or someone who has physical disabilities, which I will certainly relinquish my seat to if I get one, but it's those kind of things. And then there's just the general interaction with people. Right? There's a small window between what's, um, what demonstrates power and exudes leadership and then what's intimidating. And so on a daily basis, I have to make a decision on whether or not I'm having a conversation somebody, with someone from a position of leadership and strength or if they're intimidated. So I was taught by my dad many years ago to stand at least two to three feet away and having a conversation so that the person doesn't feel intimidated, especially in a business conversation. So there are, there are things that you would never have to think about that you'd have to do that I ultimately have to make a decision upon in order to be effective. Now, if I don't want to be effective and be reckless, I can use whatever octave in language I'd like to, which doesn't really work if you're trying to be persuasive. Or, you know, so, so I have um, a responsibility that I ultimately have to hand down to my children so that they can be successful in their relationships, whether that be uh, personal or professional relationships. So it's not as easy as it might seem. Could you tell us about your, your clothing size, your shoe size? What are the things that you have to do to accommodate your size? Right. So a lot of people say when they see me, wow, you look fairly decent. And that resonates with me because <laughs> at seven feet, that's really hard to do. Uh, just so you know, the moniker in most stores that says big and tall has nothing to do with tall, it's all for big. <laughs> so if you got a 40 inch inseam, you're just out of luck. So, um, you know, a lot of the resources that are necessary to do the job that I do, I can't write off on my taxes because my suits are very expensive. And if you wear a 16 or 17 or 18 like my son, uh, that, that's a particular challenge. And so being fashionable and showing up uh, prepared for work uh, can be a difficult task. And shoes? These are, these are 17s. Uh, thank God I have some, some great shoe designers that are friends that sometimes help me out, and then I bargain hunt as much as I can. But as you can imagine, a 16 and a 17 uh, is very difficult to come across. How did you find the socks? So, <laughs> that, was, that was a very difficult process, but much necessary. This, these socks have been... Uh, very rarely used because it was the first pair that I got when the Nets came to Brooklyn and uh, they no longer make them. So, you know, a stitch in time has saved nine many times <laughs> to save these socks. <laughs> but these are these are these are the original intro to Brooklyn Nets socks. Can you just talk a little bit more about the process that you had to go through to get measured and if, if the physicians can also weigh in? What, what about it was so difficult? because they're very particular. So, so Guinness doesn't generally come out. They're trusting that you're going to film it. So we had to, we had to video every measurement and have still photos of every measurement. The doctors had to sign off. So they literally had to put their licenses on the line uh, uh, to illustrate that they had taken correct measurements. And they had to do that three times a day. So they had to stop what they were doing, 
when I would show up, go into a private place, I had to take one standing and one laying flat on the ground, because apparently you're taller when you lay down, I, I, don't, I don't know. Are you, oh, so yeah, Doc, you can, you, can, you can tell why those measurements were and what the process was from a, from a physician's perspective. So you you might want to join me. Thank you. Uh, say your first and last name. Spelled sure. My first name is Mazin. I know it's a weird name for you guys, so it's M-A-Z-I-N. My last name is Khaled. So the measurement included uh, doing the measurement three times. Uh, it has to be standing and lying down. Now, it's very specific in the sense that the shoulder blades have to be touching the wall, the heels have to be touching the wall. That's why we needed a team of three. Somebody have to be standing actually on a short pedestal to be able to reach the councilman's head. And then the others have to check the, the integrity of the measurements. We have to make sure that everything is done up to par. Now, when you're lying down, generally speaking, you are a little bit um, longer, I would say you have more height because the pressure on your, the spaces between your, the bones in your back, the vertebra, is is less. So when you're lying down, you have few more centimeter, a point of a centimeter to a centimeter in your height, and it varies through the day as well because as the day goes, more pressure from the gravity and so forth. So it has to be done three different times in a day, as the councilman said. It's very particular. All of us have to double check, then we have to write an official letter to certifying that those are the accurate measurements. They are videotaped, they are photographed, and everything was well documented. So you mentioned someone in Croatia who's gunning for the title. There's a mayor in Ohio who claims he's seven feet. Do you have a strategy? I happen to know Brad Sellers personally, and he's not seven feet. You can have him come here. Me and Brad can do that very easily. But Is there a strategy to keep this title uh, with you in, in Brooklyn? I will do anything necessary to make sure that this title remains in Brooklyn. So, you know, you can meet me halfway between here and Ohio if you want to, Brad. You know, in, in all seriousness, this is all in good fun, but the reality is the, the platform, I hope, no matter who has it, will be used uh, to let young people know that there are opportunities no matter how you look. So if, it, if it's Brad, who I know is a, a you know, who's a, who's a, a great person, uh, and has a great heart, I'm sure that he would continue that, that uh, narrative as well. So, you know, listen, I'm very competitive. I think it belongs here. We are, you know, the biggest city in the world. I, I represent part of the biggest borough in the world, so it should be here. So, you know, sh short of elevator shoes or anything like that, I'm going to do whatever's necessary to keep it. But I got to be honest with you, um, during those measurements, this is an average of me measurements. So I think the first measurement was 6'11 and a half. I'm like, oh, man, I got this. No problem. And then as the measurements went on, we got to an average of 6'10". So I'm actually 6'11 and a half, depending on whether I've had my coffee, depending on what time of day it is. So the average was 6'10". So I would, I would, I would weigh that against anybody who's, who's submitting, because that was the average. So there is a reality that, you know, during the course of, of the day. So I think, again, I think my first measurement was 6'11 and three quarters, actually. Do you know how long you were when you were born? You don't say tall. No, so actually, um, I was one of those kids who was was tall, uh, but had a growth spurt between junior high school and high school. I think I grew like eight inches. So, you know, I always tell the story. My mom was a very frugal and a, a great fiscal steward for our house. And uh, back then, you know, you young people don't know anything about layaway. We had layaways <laughs> back then. So my, my, my mother would We'd always be fresh when we went to school because my mother would put things on layaway three seasons ahead of time at the right size that she would estimate that you'd be three seasons later. And, um, you know, she was pretty horrified when she opened the packaging, you know, for the first week of school. And there was no way I was getting in that stuff. Like, and she was just like, I remember her saying to me like it was yesterday, I don't know whether I'd rather clothe you or feed you. <laughs> and I was like, uh, lady, I think you got to do both. <laughs> Where do you get your height from in your family? Yeah, so, so both parents were, were tall, so, you know, maybe, you know, a 5'11 mom and, and, and above six foot dad usually uh, produces that. So I wasn't taking any chances, as you can see, uh, to mess up that bloodline, so. Is your record going to be in next year's book? Yeah, if, it's not, if I'm not mistaken, it's there until it's removed. So uh, prior, we, when we did the research, we knew who the person was prior to us, but, but after I got the record, they seemed to banish him from the earth. So I'm trying to avoid banishment by holding on to this as long as I can. But yes, I think, I think it stays and it's repetitive until which time someone supplants the record. 2019? Yes. Yeah. And Councilman, can you just 
just talk a little bit more about what you mentioned earlier about the message you want to send to kids who feel that they can only do certain things because of what they look like or where they come from. Do you, especially being in this position, do you find that young kids are still feeling that those are their limitations and just can Yeah, 100%. I think we live in a very visual society. And unfortunately for us, we still live in a society that what they can't understand, it ultimately destroys. So where there isn't a space that's been carved out or created prior to something, uh, people either try to force you into that because that's all that their mind can fathom. Uh, and that's very uncomfortable for some people. Some people don't want to, or for whatever reason, like we, we've, we've, we've as a society placed um, uh, an extra emphasis on sports, right? And sometimes above all else. So above being a physician, which is why Torian, as a friend, I love him so much. So while he did pay, play sports, he still had a focus on helping through medicine. So there are people who really need to know that, yes, you know, sports as a part of life, um, as, as a way to move your body, as a competitive spirit is great. But there are so many other ways that you can that you can serve. And for, for, for young people, if they don't see anyone who looks like themselves, whether it's through ethnicity, whether it's through body type or body or body size, um, it's very difficult for them to find a pathway for themselves. So I'm hoping that I've created or at least opened up the idea that there's a pathway no matter, no matter how you look. Did you want to say anything about your time at St. John's? Then? Yeah, that was, the, that was honestly, um, big shout out to Luke Honoseco, who's still alive and very, very, listen, if I saw Lou today, he would remind me of some rebound that I missed in practice. Like, this dude, he's like, I've never met anyone like him. You would think at, you know, in his mid-90s that, and having coached thousands of players, that he would not re remember you when he sees you. And it has nothing to do with what I do today. It's just that he's a gentleman and he really was responsible for shaping the lives of young, of, I went to St. John's when I was 17 years old. He was responsible for shaping uh, very many young people's lives, including mine, and that was just a great time. You know, listen, I played on one of the most famous teams in the history of the city of New York, not just St. John's University, that Final Four team, if people remember, was made up of it was the only time I think that St. John's has had all of its players from the tri-state area and to be, have that level of success. So those were the, the last glory days of actually going to Brooklyn and Queens and as far as Atlantic City, Willie Glass, and really the tri-state area and putting together a team that can compete with the rest of the country. Um, we haven't seen that again. So it was, it was a special team, a special time, and we still talk. I talked to Shelton Jones uh, yesterday via Skype. I thought he was in Amityville, but he was in Charlotte, North Carolina. So. He said he couldn't catch a flight here by, by the time to be here, or he would have been here. So they, that, listen, I, I really covet uh, that time, and we get together often, and when we don't get together, we speak by telephone. Yes. Council member, have you ever wished to be shorter? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Growing up, uh, the first time you go on a shopping spree with, you know, I can remember at 13 years old, you know, being allowed for the first time to have my own money and to go to uh, Orchard Street. <laughs> Those of us who come from the hood know how important Orchard Street was. And, and be with my, with my peers, who were also 13-year-olds, and not being able to purchase anything. And thinking, man, I wish, you know, if I could just be shorter, if I could just fit in, if I could be normal. So yeah, that was a great part of my life, thinking about being normal. I'm, gl I'm glad today not to be normal. But it's tough when you're trying to fit in. If you're in, in elementary school, junior high school, you don't want to be singled out. You want to be a part of, of the crowd. And that's very difficult to do if you're above average tall, if you're above average weight, if you, you, know, if, if you have any things that are not consistent with what society has dictated that a 12, 11, 12, or 13, or the, you know, that peer group, because that changes every year, right? What, what's acceptable? And if you don't fit into that, so the question is absolutely yes. How were you, uh, you notified about winning this, and what was your reaction? Uh, was it a phone call? Was it a, I don't know. No, so when you, when, you, when you apply, there's an intranet site that you then begin to communicate with the officials at, at Guinness Book. So if you have any questions, you submit your measurements. And through that internal mechanism, I was, uh, I was given the information that I may have achieved. You know, they kind of bait I was, um, you, may have, you may have done it, finally. And then I had to reach out, and then they confirmed it, and then said that they would ultimately summarily be sending out um, the supporting documentation. And then as soon as I got that, 
in my anxiety, I immediately Googled myself and was already in the Guinness Book of World Records. So way before you actually get the, I mean, almost, almost um, immediately upon the, the designation, they, they submit it. So. so at least electronically, so I don't know how long it takes for the actual physical book, but electronically, if you went today, I'm already for as long as that lasts, the uh, Guinness Book of World Records holder. One last question. Are there any tall jokes that you didn't tell that you'd like to tell us now? <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I would like to say is I think it's funny that things that people say to me in passing would not be accepted to any other, uh, any other kind of abnormality. So for example, I will put my colleague, Lori Cumbo on the spot. <laughs> One day we had a jeans and something day at the council. So I wore my favorite jeans and we were out on the steps of City Hall and she turned to me and said, oh my God, I can't believe they make jeans in your size. <laughs> and I said, while that was funny, had I been overweight and you said that, she would be on her way to HR. <laughs> Had I, been, had I been incredibly short, and she said that, quick trip to HR. So it's funny the things that people say to me. I can, I can meet someone in, in passing, and they can say, oh my god, what kind of bed must you sleep in? And I'm saying, wow, that's odd. What, would you say that to someone who was heavy? Oh my god, I've never seen anybody as heavy as you before in my life. I can't imagine what kind of bed you must sleep in. That would be horrifying to the public, but people say, things like that to me every day. And then they say, well, you, you know, being tall is awesome. So, you know, so there's this kind of idea that, um, you know, that, that things and pleasantries that are exchanged or not pleasantries that are exchanged, I'm devoid of feeling a particular way about them when they're said to me. So I just think that's funny. And so I, I did finally put Lori Combo on full blast. <laughs> I hope HR doesn't call her though. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Oh, oh, wait, 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 before we go, I do have to say that my, my good friend and homeboy from Brooklyn, Tracy Morgan, was halfway here and um, uh, got stuck and couldn't make it, but uh, his people are still here. <laughs> and um, he kept, so Big Mo kept coming. Um, but I, I wanna say that, so we in Brooklyn, as Brooklynites, really stick together. The two people I called that were celebrities that I wanted to stand with me and normally would, who represent Brooklyn, uh, was Tracy Morgan and Spike Lee. I called Spike and I got the most incredible ring, so I'm, he must still be an Aspen or something because it's one of those rings that, that you get. But I called and reached out to, to, I reached out to Tracy and his people and they were like, dude, what time do you need us to be there? Because he's so ingrained in Brooklyn and is doing such a great job in Brooklyn. And I think the next, the next installment of The Last OG begins in April. And so please tune into that because that's my friend. And hopefully that buys me a cameo in, <laughs> in, in the last OG. But shout out to Tracy Morgan for sure. Thank you.